I used to get picked on quite a bit. And then one day I was just like, nah, not anymore. Like, why am I sitting here being all fucking sad? That hit a trigger me and then I started preparing like I'm actually trying to run a clinic on everyone. There's a different feeling when you know you can walk into a room and at the very least you can defend yourself. The feeling that you have in the back dressing room is one that you can't prepare yourself for and you can't replicate pure nerve. Guys, welcome to another episode of the Tai Kamo podcast, the number one platform for sharing stories worth telling. So if that's your kind of jam, make sure to hit that subscribe button. To begin with, bro, anyone who engages in one-on-one combat through MMA or boxing, mm-hmm. I have nothing but respect for them. It takes a special type of courage to get in the ring, you know, especially when you know that your head can get taken off at any time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You fought in the cage nine times. Yeah. You trained at a well-known MMA gym in Manchester called SBG, founded by Carl Tanswell. He was one of the first to receive a BJJ black belt in the UK. After six years with SBG, you went on to form your own MMA gym called the Wayfair Academy. Yeah. Where you now spend your time coaching people the sweet science of MMA. Yeah. Abdul Chowdhury, welcome to the podcast, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Right, lots to get in today. But before we do, man, let's take it back a little bit, Mm -hmm. right? I want to know a little bit about yourself. Your bio on social media reads, obsessed with MMA. So to begin with, where did this obsession start from? The obsession with MMA probably started when I first started training. Um, but the obsession with fighting in general um, started long before I knew what MMA was. Um, I used to go to a Kung Fu school when I was small, maybe I think like five or six. Um, I used to practice martial arts in the backyard. Um, I had my own class in primary school where I used to teach kids had to do the splits. Can you do the splits now? <laughs> no, no, I cannot. <laughs> um, but I used, to, I used to teach kids uh, just how to do, because they used to see me like training and stuff and they yeah. used to be like, oh, it wasn't anything crazy. It was just standard Kung Fu stuff. And how old were you at this point? 10. 10, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Kung so, Fu is good at like 10. That was a yeah, Kung Fu yeah. days actually. Yeah, yeah it was, Jackie yeah, Chan yeah. and all, that was yeah. big them days, isn't it? So we, we didn't really have much TV in my house growing up. We, we had some, we had TV, it's not, but we didn't we used to watch it that much. Um, but we did have a big collection of Bruce Lee, Jet Li, Jackie Chan, uh, Yan Biao, all those guys. Um, and we just used to watch that stuff on repeat. So it was martial arts was at the big forefront in my family, especially. And that's, you know, that's kind of panned out the way it has with all my family that trains. And I've got a ton of family members that train, fight. Some train for lifestyle purposes. Some Even fight. back then? Or is that yeah, just yeah. recently? No, well, obviously, uh, recently they started to compete and stuff. But we used to, we used to always family events we would be the kids getting together in the living room we move the tables aside and we just mess about sometimes it'd get a bit out of hand but you know that's where it started and then I was a pretty shy kid so yeah, I got into quite a few fights in my high school I used to get picked on quite a bit I think in my first year of high school and then one day I was just like nah uh, not anymore so I had the first fight I ever had um, and it felt good hitting somebody and I know that sounds however it sounds, but it just felt, it's more so the case of like, oh, I could I could keep someone off me if I hit him. It, it sounds like, you no, know, you've had enough, basically, of someone picking on you, taking yeah. your kindness yeah, yeah. or weakness sort yeah. of thing, and then you just retaliate one day and I thought, you know what, I'm not having this anymore, yeah. I've had it. It's empowering, is yeah. what the feeling is. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think being able to stand up for yourself is, is empowering and, and having the confidence to defend yourself is empowering. And ultimately, I think that's what training and official training provides, is it's, it's that there's something if you, there's a different feeling when you know you can walk into a room and at the very least you can defend yourself. Um, there's a different level of, of peace that comes with that. hundred um, percent. And I think that, that, that feeling, if you can pass that on to students, um, and have it be based in reality, um, which is really important. Um, that's invaluable in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think that time I got into my first fight, I hit the guy and I was like, Oh, I just, I just took an action there that was in my own favor. Do you know what I mean? And it kind of catapulted from there. So from there, I kind of got a bit, maybe a bit sensitive in terms of like, as soon as someone said anything to me, I would just, I would just get into a fight. And it's not because I liked fighting necessarily, not the action of fighting, but I was just like, oh, if I hit him, if I hit him, he, he stumbles back. If I grab him here, he can't really do anything. And that's where the kind of technical side of things fighting, but I, I just hadn't had any training at that time, we used to do this thing called, you'll probably remember this, um, we used to do this thing called rumbles where we just, it's a bit essentially wrestling. Because I was smaller, I would lose against guys that were quite a lot bigger than me. And then after school, me and my friend would go to the park 
and we try and recreate the scenario again and we try and look for solutions. The next day I'd go into school, I'd look for the same big guy again and I'd offer him out on a rumble. And we, I just kept doing that until I could figure them, figure them out. I wasn't a rough and tumble kid necessarily in high school. I was, a, I was like a smart kid. Um, so to the teachers, it was a bit, <laughs> why is this, why is this? A star student or whatever. Why is he wrestling with all the all the ruffians in the school? So just to clarify for the audience, you was an A star student. You was getting A's throughout your GCSEs. Yeah. So it, this with 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 academics, it's always been the case for me that if I was interested in something, I would I would put the work in and I'd excel at it. So I was a mix. So for the subjects I was interested in, I was an A A star student. So for the subjects I wasn't interested in, that range would go right down to like a G or a U. Um, so I very rarely got a B on anything. I got a few couple of B's um, in, in high school, um, but I was A's or failure. I had to follow the same pattern in, in college and I followed the same pattern in uni for the semesters that I wasn't that interested in. I wouldn't do well at all. Uh, for the semesters that I was interested in, I would I would like get really good good marks. So just to summarise, you were kind of a decent kid, well man, it didn't get into trouble as much. No, no. Yeah, just kept yeah. yourself to yourself, but obviously you were picked on, unfortunately, Yeah, yeah. which led to you at some point having enough thinking yeah. you know what i'm not having this yeah yeah retaliating that sparked some mma interest maybe yeah, at that yeah. point yeah, you, did, you yeah. might have not known it's mma at the time yeah, yeah, but yeah. it sparked some form of interest yeah and i find it fascinating that at that young age you went to the park yeah to try to replicate the scenario yeah that's quite interesting bro that's that's that's, I, that's, that's I genius that. absolutely loved it like i'd be like oh this guy grabbed me in a headlock uh, yeah grabbed me from a headlock from here and then we just, we'd try and figure it out um and then when i thought we figured it out we'd go back we'd do it I'd I'd, uh, I'd I'd get into a rumble with the guy and we'd try and sort it out again. And I enjoyed it. Do you know what I mean? I enjoyed doing that because then when I'd solve the problem, I'd be like, okay, cool. Now I know a little bit more about fighting. I absolutely hated fights because I don't like, I'm not someone that enjoys conflict that much in the sense that, you know, like you get a fight, you get into a fight with somebody and then 10 years later, they've not let it go. Do you know what I mean? I don't like stuff like that. Um, I think... Obviously, life's too short for that kind of stuff. And I was, as a kid, I was uncomfortable with that kind of stuff as well. Uh, but if it was like a well-mannered competitive bar, like, oh, let's wrestle. And then that's it. After this, it's like, yeah, we're done. Like, it's just a thing. I really enjoyed that. And then I'd really enjoy fighting as long as I didn't like the stuff that came after the fighting. I love the fighting part itself. It's um, to make sense. Hence why you're obsessed with MMA, you yeah, put yeah, it in yeah. your bio, yeah? Moving on with the timeline, let's keep the timeline going, actually, to be fair. Uh, when did you start training with SPG or what was the next step in the process of, you know, becoming? So after after high school ended, I went over to college. Um, I was really popular in high school just because I would get into, like, rumbles. I was popular with the smart kids because I was also a smart kid. So I, I was kind of friends with everyone in high school. In college, it was a big cold shock to me just because I walked in and it's like, it's such a different environment than I was used to. So I became a quiet kid again. What was it about the environment in college? College is where people this, usually thrive, right? Yeah, yeah. You went the opposite. I went the opposite way. And this is why this is going to sound hilarious now, because I deal with so many different types of people. In high school, it was just Asian kids, black kids, the odd token white kid. When I went to college, everyone was white. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I, do you know what I mean? I, I didn't know that many white people existed in, in Manchester. I just thought, oh, everyone's, everyone's, everyone's Asian or everyone, everyone's Asian or African. And, and, and that was it. Um, so that was a big cause shock to me. And so it wasn't that I was like scared. It was just like, I didn't know how to, how to interact with people. How to uh, fit in essentially. How to fit in. Um, I think some people thrived because they could change their identity. Um, I still came, I, the, my attempts to fit in was to try and be like the way I was in high school, which was a bit more authentic to the way I am. And, you know, for example, there was a, there was a girl that looked like the girl from Spider-Man 1. Do you remember yeah, skinny Mary man? Jane, yeah, yeah, the blonde girl. Yeah, but not Mary Jane, you know, the, the, the landlord's skinny daughter. No, that's probably why I don't remember yeah. it. <laughs> so it's the, <laughs> it the landlord's skinny daughter, right? Um, and she looked exactly like her. So this girl's built like an absolute stick, right? Uh, bless her. And she was talking about, we were talking about the most traumatic things for some reason. I don't know why this would be a good icebreaker from the teacher, but we were supposed to talk about the most traumatic things that happened to us. Looking back at it now, it's a bit of a weird, weird icebreaker, <laughs> but whatever. And obviously coming from... Longsight and the Anson estate and all that stuff. We have had our fair share of seeing things as we grow up, hiding our phones and our socks and hiding our change in our socks in case someone tells us to jump, all that kind of stuff. And this, the worst thing this girl, this, this girl went through was on her last day of school, some boy, she was walking past and some boy called her a slag. 
And I was like, that was your most traumatic event. So I started, I laughed because I just thought it was funny. I thought she was joking. I didn't know she was being serious. I thought, ah, oh, this is a joke clearly. And everyone looked at me like, Ooh. Ooh. So from that point on, I was like, oh, maybe I should just shut the fuck up and just be quiet. Um, and I'll just, <laughs> I'll just glide through college. And that's what I did. I just, I just thought, okay, well, I'll just keep myself to myself here. Um, and that's what I did through college. Um, after college, so during college, I did, I did English literature, I did English language, I did psychology. Um, those, were, those were my three subjects. I, was it I, the same trend? You excelled in them as well in college? Yeah, I excelled in them in college. I didn't do so well in literature. Um, and that was the class that I felt like I didn't fit in. Um, however, my university degree was in literature and creative writing, um, which I did well in. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was the subject itself. Um, I just think I wasn't as engaged for whatever reason in those, during those years. Um, in that session. So during my English language, we had, we had one of the things we had to write was an opinion piece on MMA. I just thought, you know what? I don't like this MMA stuff for whatever reason. I just made a blanket statement like, oh, I don't like MMA. There's no class in it. I just kind of like, whatever, just went with the mainstream kind of thought at the time. And you've got to bear in mind, this was 2009, 10. And so uh, I was going to write and I give an opinion piece. I just thought, let me do my due diligence and- Let me at least check it out. Let me at least check it out. Let me watch enough to know that I have an actual opinion on this instead of just regurgitating stuff that I've heard. Um, and so I watched MMA and then I didn't stop. I just kept watching it. And then I wrote, I handed in my assignment and then I spent the rest of the summer just watching MMA, morning till night. I would just sit there, I'd wake up. I had, I had on an external hard drive, I had UFC one all the way to, I think it was like 126 at the time. And I just watched all of them. Um, I just sat there and I just watched and I just watched and I just watched. Next, 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 next. I started doing research on MMA. <clears throat> I saw, funnily enough now, Aaron Wilkinson, who um, owns a gym called Day Walkers now. He used to train at one of the original gyms out in Liverpool and then he moved over to SPG. And then I started researching, okay, let me just research SPG. Um, I started finding interviews from Carl Tanswell. Yeah, who we mentioned in the intro is the one of the first guys to get a... BJJ black belt in the UK. Yeah, he's a, he was a pioneer of UK MMA. Um, almost any and all coaches that exist today in Manchester have been coached by him at some point. I think he single-handedly created the MMA scene in Manchester. Maybe there's a few other contributors, but nowhere near the same impact as him. And the reason for that was because he was just someone that loved martial arts and he loved people. Um, and he would have a funny way of showing it, but you know he would he would absolutely care about martial arts and, and people getting better at martial arts and so it was understandable that most people were training with him and um, i found our wilkinson training with him uh so i was uh, like our wilkinson trains there let me just do some research on spg found interviews of carl i liked the way he thought i liked the way he coached um i liked how honest he was um i liked how much he cared about martial arts you could see that right through i think anyone that's been coached by carl will understand the passion that he has will understand the passion that he had for martial arts and so I went there um, on my first day of uni, my loan dropped. I walked straight over to SPG and I was like, I spoke to Carl, Carl was there and he, I was like, I'm ready to pay for a year's membership. And he laughed and he goes, hey kid, like, how do you know we may be shit? We, this may be a shit class. That was his response? That was his response. And he's there like, do the session first, do today. And then if you like it, we'll, we'll sort stuff out later. That uh, shows the type of person Carl was about from the get go. Like my first, my first impression of him was he was there like, he was very big on the truth. He's, he was a very high integrity individual. And I think in a coach, in someone that you put your trust into, integrity is probably the number one character trait that coaches should develop and should hold themselves accountable to. If our processes are flawed and our coaching is flawed or our approach as an athlete is flawed, it goes to show inside of the cage. So you'll fight a guy, there's a, there's a good chance of you losing against. Um, and so, again, the integrity of your processes as an athlete, like, did you wake up on time? Did you go to sleep on time? Did you recover properly? Did you eat good food? Are you, are you monitoring your training load? Are you training the right things? If you are, it's not just about how many hours you're training, it's about the quality of that training. Um, are you working on the right things for this fight? How do you deal with distractions outside of fight camp um, how do you deal with all of these things so then for those nine minutes or 15 minutes you can perform to the best of your ability 
Uh, was you learning all of these things that you just mentioned so eloquently there for the time you were with Carl? Is that what he was teaching you, ingraining in you? Yeah, Carl absolutely ingrained that. He absolutely, uh, I think the number one thing Carl coached extremely well um, or had people understand viscerally is that skills and character, because skills is a byproduct of character. And if, you're, if your character is flawed, um, you'll have a glass ceiling of your skill. So if you don't have the courage to take up chances in the training room, you won't get better, right? So if you're bothered about your ego, if you're bothered about looking cool, you've won your your you've won ten fights now. You think you're the shit, and some guy comes in and he wants to beat you up. And instead of instead of just working the things that you sh should be working on and that you need to work on um, in order to make your skills better, you decide to put a paste in on this guy instead that because you were scared of looking stupid that's a character flaw does mm. that make sense interesting yeah so yeah. it the better your character is um the better you approach your training and the better you approach your training the better skills you get the better skills you get and the better the better you perform and then you get the result and this is why mma was so pure and it is so pure um when it's done when it's done properly in a, in a contest. Um, and I think this is what draws people to compete in. They first start training, they're like, you know, let me just see how good I am. Or let me see how well these whole, these skills hold up against someone that is actually trying to fight me that's also trained. Um, and that's where it goes from. When you enter the gym to meet Carl, for example, how would you describe your level of skill? Was it beginner, novice? I did not know what the fuck I was doing, right. obviously. That's um, reassuring. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how to train. I didn't know anything. This is this is another great thing about Carlton as well is that he really focused on the whole community. So it, when I say community, I mean every single person that walked through the doors of that gym. Um, it wasn't that. Oh, look, this kid's talented. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on him, right? Although naturally, as a coach when you do see potential in somebody for an athletic career and it, and they do want to be an athlete, you are excited for them to reach that potential. That's normal. However, it is, Carl was very big on every person that walked through the doors. And this is something I try and carry with me when I try and understand the value of coaching and the responsibility of coaching. It is not about just the athlete. It is about the dad with two kids that's stuck in a, normal has his normal routine and needs the stability to take care of his family but he just wants something to challenge him he comes in twice a week that person plays an important role in the gym and martial arts is for somebody like that it's an opportunity for that guy to get stronger it's an opportunity for that guy to become more disciplined it's an opportunity for that guy to become a better father because like we spoke about character and skill are intertwined you can't have one without the other yeah it makes sense when you when you become physically able mm -hmm. it transfers to other areas of your life that's, that's what you're saying exactly in order to gain the skills of mixed martial arts we have to we have to respect and put ourselves forward to the process and sometimes putting ourselves forward isn't enough because the way we put ourselves forward isn't good enough so turning up to class late is not good enough thinking you can just walk on the mat whenever you want is not good enough talking during warm-ups not good enough and it's not that you can't do those things you can uh, like even in my i don't run a dictatorship it's not like oh you're late for class you can't come but all of those small actions have consequences over the long run you gotta think the way you should think about training of martial arts is if i was training for five years six years seven years um what small habits and what small mindsets and what small approach differences to my approach will make the big difference over a seven year time span um, and I think people be like oh it's just a session um, but okay if you think it's just a session then you do just a session and that's totally fine yeah 100% we'll go into that a little bit deeper a bit later on because I'm going to talk about the crisis of masculinity and how we can okay yeah yeah because okay, I think cool. you know uh, that's one way. Hot, this might be a hot topic. This, but yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> honestly, I think um, it ties in everything. Um, like you know, there's kids out there doing all sorts of madness. For example, right? Yeah. The gym people respect the dojo. They come in, they learn certain things. You know, I, I've heard parents say, "Look, my, my kid's totally different when he's with you guys." And yeah. do you know what I mean? And when he's home, he's an animal, which we'll we'll get into a bit yeah. later on, and how that you know how the environment can shape that. Touching upon 
you know, you mentioned obviously training with Carl and when you entered the gym, you was complete novice. How long was it before you had your first fight? Just out of curiosity. Three years and then three years. it's been, and then I competed for six years after that. Okay. So what was, what, what did that three years look like? So MMA is a mixture of disciplines, right? Yeah. So what did the structure look like? I would do every single class available, every single session that was taught, I would do it. Um, and I did that for the first three years before I had a fight. And then once I had a fight and I'd graduated, remember I came in at the same time as I started uni. So I'd, I had my first fight at the same time as I graduated university. I was at a crossroads of, okay, what am I gonna do now? This is gonna sound dramatic, but <laughs> if after graduating, I think people fall into this kind of big ditch where they don't know what to do with the rest of their time. Um, they're figuring out oh, what's the what's the next step forward? How can I move forward? And there's a lot of pressure on a 21 year old or a 22 year old to f to f suddenly figure it out yeah. in the space of a month or two um, and get a job. And a lot of them will get into a job that they don't really like and do it. And that's totally fine. Um, that's for some people. But the cut, so what I had to sit with myself was okay. Well, what am I going to do now? And I put it to myself this way. If I was to die in the next year or the next two years, what do I want to die in the pursuit of? And I know that sounds dramatic as fuck, but I still ask myself those questions. Like if what I'm trying to build towards, if I don't build it and I die before then, will I still, if someone was to bring me back to life just for five minutes was like, hey, was the last three years worth it? Would you, would you, would you do it again? Is this worth dying for? If the answer's not yet, I'm not spending my time on it. Um, so right now, that that for me is Wayfarer. Like if I uh, I want to build Wayfarer up to a certain point, I want it to do certain things. And if I die on the way, I'm okay with that. And that's how I know it's the right answer for me. Okay, interesting, man. So it was with three years until you got your first fight. Was it Carl or the coaches thought that you're ready for a fight or did you suggest that, you know what, I want to fight? Yeah, so it's a bit of it's a bit of both. Um, we would, and I have I I, pra I follow the same practice with my students now. Is we never ask someone to compete uh, because a coach has a massive influence on on people, um, students especially. And you might get someone that doesn't want to compete, but they'll say yeah because they think that's what you want. Um, and I don't want anyone to compete unless they absolutely want to. In fact, I would dissuade people from competing until they show me they actually really do want to compete because competing is. Getting into a fight is not a... It's not a joke. It's not a joke. Um, That's good, that, because you cultivate a friendly environment and a comfortable environment for your students, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But then being an athlete and being a competitor is requires a different... It requires a different level of investment. Like, if the 45-year-old if the dad that wants to come in and wants to train twice a week, I am not going to have people hit him in the head repeatedly. I'm not gonna have him like rolling rough so he can't like spend time with his kids and he's like aching the next day. Like, I don't want that for him. He can gain the benefit of that. He just wants something fun to do. He wants to pick a skill that's actually gonna improve him. Improve him. He's gonna be around a community that supports him and, and he feels comfortable in. But if a, if a 16 year old athlete or a 17 year old, 18 year old, 21 year old, 22 year old athlete goes, oh, I wanna be the next world champion. Okay, well, you better behave like it. Um, which means I want to see you in training. I want to see you recovering properly. I want to see you not make excuses. Just tell me what you want and I'll hold you accountable to it. And I think as a coach, that's your job. It's not to push anyone in any certain directions. It's to understand what that person wants and let them tell you what they want and then hold them accountable to, to that. I like that, man. Yeah. I like that approach. Can you remember your first fight? Yeah. Yeah. So my first fight was against a guy called Nico Alonso. It was my first amateur fight. He had just fought, he was coming down a weight class. At the time, I was absolutely tiny. So um, there wasn't many weight classes when I first started training. And flyweights, which was the weight class I competed at, 56 kilos, was very few and far between. Um, for my first couple of fights, I weighed in at 54 kilos. I was absolutely tiny, right? Um, so you, you fought at flyweight? Yeah, flyweight, yeah. 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 Um, but I always came under the flyweight limit. Before walking out to a fight, the feeling that you have in the back dressing room is one that you can't prepare yourself for and you can't replicate. I was thinking, what the hell, what the hell is going on? Like my face was fuzzy, my mouth was dry, and all this stuff. And then if Carl wasn't there, I would not know what would have happened. But is it just pure nerves? Pure nerves, right. And it's not even the fact that it's about 
It's just, it's not the fight itself that makes you nervous. It's, it's failing, it's having to put in all that time and it not come to fruition. It's knowing on the other side of those doors when you walk downstairs in 10 minutes, you're gonna be judged by everyone in the crowd, even though they probably don't give a shit really, but you're gonna, the feeling feels like you're gonna be judged by everyone in the crowd. Uh, if you lose, you're gonna be, you're gonna be letting down all your friends, you're gonna be letting down all these people, you're gonna be letting down your coaches. Um, and there's a good, you know, there's a good chance of you losing because the other guy is also coming in there to win. Um, and he has prepared for this day and he is in the back dressing room and he is preparing to beat you up the same way you're preparing to beat him up. Um, and for the last eight weeks, 10 weeks, you both have been preparing for this moment. And for that all to come to a head, that's the nerves. Um, and overcoming that point is some is something that takes time. But what Carl said to me, he came over to me and he was like, like and I do this with my own fires. I, I pretty much just <laughs> copy what Carl's done. Um, I try my best to anyway. Um, and he comes over to me and he goes, is your mouth dry? I go, yeah. And he goes, normal. He goes, uh, your, are your cool, palms sweaty? Yeah. He goes, are your palms sweaty? I go, yeah. yeah. And he goes, normal. And yeah, he goes, yeah. He's putting you at ease in it. Yeah, he's putting me at ease. And he goes, all, everything you're feeling in your body right now is just your body getting you ready to fight. It doesn't know the difference between being scared and being excited. And I was like, oh, and he's like, the other guy is feeling the exact same thing. And he goes, this is just your body getting you ready to fight. So don't fight it. Yeah, you've done all the training. You've you've prepared properly. He goes, how many times, how many times have you missed a session? And the real answer was zero. Because I hadn't missed a session for the last three years. Do you know what I mean? Um, outside of having an assignment to hand in, where I missed like two days to make sure the assignment gets done, I hadn't missed a session, right? And he's like, well, so trust your training. And he's like, you're going to go out there, you're going to you're gonna stick it on this kid, let your body do what it's going to do. You've prepared for this moment. And having that, and I didn't go out there and put on a stellar performance. I won the fight. Um, but just having that, was like, I think there was a different presence when Carl was in your corner. Um, and I feel like my guys have that, not with me necessarily. I don't have a massive presence. Um, uh, one of our other coaches, Jack, he, he, has a, he has a pretty good presence. So I like having him in, him in, having him in the corner um, because he just brings that kind of, uh, that, that, that fire to, uh, to what, what some athletes need. And I bring the, I bring the cool. Um, so, you know, it's a good balance. Elliot brings the cool as well. One of our other coaches, he's very stoic. Um, he keeps, he's the good balance between me and Jack. But yeah, like if Car if I hadn't, if I hadn't heard that, I wouldn't have walked out there and performed. I would have absolutely. So it's a feeling for those who've never fought in a cage before. I wondered how it feels like before a fight. It's intense nerves. Your body's almost shutting down the way you described it. Yeah. But obviously, as Carl said, it's your body preparing to go yeah. into a fight. It's going to a war, yeah. right? And the fear really is that what people are going to think of you ultimately mm -hmm. it's the yeah. failure of failure of that aspect what they're going to think of your yeah. failure Do yeah, you know yeah. What I, mean? I think every man should compete at least once in their life or at least engage in some form of mma boxing and you know i think it makes people better individuals man yeah. and they like you said before they'll be able to transfer that in other avenues of life yeah. Do you know what i mean we talked off camera that you know you win some you lose some right mm -hmm. you can't win it all in mma yeah yeah what, what did you learn from your defeats Every defeat, I learned something different. My first defeat showed me that I can actually lose because I went, I went from my amateur MMA debut and I went to five and zero. I was fighting for a title. I had beaten really good guys. Um, I was the number one ranked amateur flyweight in the country at the time, and I fought a guy that just prepared better than me. He was. We were equally skilled, equally skilled, but he just had the right fight on the game day and even then it was a close fight but in MMA it doesn't matter man like ultimately the scoreboard is he he won that fight and I lost that fight and I remember being absolutely distraught I am not I am not a, I am a graceful loser to my opponent but like to myself I am not a graceful loser like I sat there in the back room and I fucking cried my eyes out for a good half hour um, and then Carl in Carl Tanswell fashion was I like he was, he, he was very supportive at the time um, and then 
10 minutes and he's like, all right, get over yourself. Um, you lost the fight. Like you thought you think you're going to win every single fight. <laughs> um, amateur anyway, he goes, yeah. you, you, we fight hard fights. That's what we do. And that is also something I take in with my guys as well. It's we're not here to massage our egos. We are here to get better as fighters. And that means we take those shots where we, where we have, we have the opportunity to overcome a bigger challenge. And if we fail, that's okay. But we'll go, we'll go try again. Um, because ultimately it doesn't matter until you're pro. When you're pro, it's different because there's money involved. There's like a career involved. There's all this stuff involved. But your, your years as an amateur is there to apply your trade. And so every, every fight is a good fight. Every fight is a good fight. Win or lose, every fight is a good fight. You can, I have been upset with some losses and some wins more than I have been with some losses. Um, so yeah, I think you learn, you learn how to get back on the horse. You learn some resilience. I think the time I learned the most, the losses I learned the most from was I had three losses on the bounce. Back to back? Back to back. Um, one was like, I made a terrible mistake and I got caught with something I shouldn't have got caught with. The fight was like 20 seconds long. I got caught in a guillotine and I got a bit cocky and, and let it go on. I was going through some personal stuff as well outside uh, and I let that affect me um, in the fight. Second fight, um, I was going against, I was going against uh, a really good guy. He was a really good pro now. Um, and I absolutely fucked up the weight cut. Um, and I didn't rehydrate properly. I didn't do all these things properly. That's not an excuse. Like the fight would have played out however it would have played out, but I learned to be a little bit more professional um, and not just rely on skills, but rely on rely on being an athlete. Um, and then the third fight was I lost my coach two weeks before that fight. Um, and in that fight, I wasn't going in to win. I was going in just lost meaning, fight. Lost meaning, sorry. You lost, lost your coach, meaning? He, he passed away. Oh, okay. So Carl Tanswell passed away two weeks before that fight. That was in 2018, right? 2018. And then that fight I lost because I wasn't trying to win that fight. I was trying to have a fight. Um, and so I've still got a mark on my face from that, from that fight, a small nick in my eye. Um, my face, I, my fighting style usually is pretty clean. Um, in that fight, I just had a five round a five round war. Uh, my face was unrecognizable like after the fight. Uh, but then after that, I think having three losses in the bounce and all that stuff as an amateur, I had to kind of snap myself out of it. I didn't snap myself out of it straight away. I just lost my coach. I had just lost three, three, three um, fights in the bounce. I still kept turning up to the gym. I wasn't present with the training and all that stuff. I still turned up to train. And I was sat there one day and I think my coach came up to me uh, at the time, Matt, he came up to me. He goes, I got a fight for you. And I go, okay. I think it was Aaron Parkinson. I was fine. He's one of the Jets coaches at uh, Predators. He's a good guy. Um, and he goes, I go, yeah, okay. Because um, I, I had a rule in my head never to turn down a fight. So I said, yeah, okay. Although I didn't really feel like it. And then his response was, let's smoke this kid. That was it. It was, a, it was one sentence, and I still don't think he knows how much of an impact that had on me at the time. He goes, let's smoke this kid. And then what went off in my head was, yeah, obviously. Like, yeah, I should be smoking this kid. Like, why am I sitting here being all fucking sad? Feeling sorry for yourself. Feeling sorry for myself. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I lost my coach. Yeah, I've lost three fights and a bounce, but what am I going to do? Am I just going to be Am I just going to be sad? Or am I going to start am I going to smoke people? So <laughs> since that, that, that hit, that hit a trigger me. And then I started preparing, like I'm actually, like I'm actually trying to run a clinic on everyone. And from that fight onwards, I had all my best performances. Um, I think I ended up with like maybe 15 fights total. Not all of them have been recorded. Um, 15 fights total from that day on that, all my performances were performances I could be proud of. Yeah, man. So definitely, yeah, man. I said to you before, I want to talk about like masculinity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. It's a bit of an odd topic, but yeah, I want yeah, to be yeah. a bit yeah, outside yeah, the box, yeah, right? Yeah. As I was saying before, it's, I believe it's super important uh -huh. to put our young boys into some form of combat training, Yeah. right? Whether it's BJJ, wrestling, boxing, big fan of it. I think it develops character, bro. Yeah. Uh, general question to start off with, what's your thoughts of the youth of today in general? The culture that they're in makes them soft. They're a little bit entitled, they have short attention spans. 
I think the number one thing is just the ability to focus. Yeah. Yeah. For a short period of time. I yeah, think 100%. if you can do that, then you're going to be miles ahead of the other kids. I'll just say a point blank. Do you think men are getting weaker? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. I think, you know, when you go through suffering, bro, it's like a rise of yeah. passage for men. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to go through that, bro. You have to, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Some form of suffering. It's essential. Essential. Have you seen any, like any of your students you've been coaching, whether SBG or Wafer Academy, have you seen a transformation in children or kids or Absolutely. teenagers? Some of the fighters I have now, they're like in their early 20s and I, I started coaching them when they were teenagers and they were like a little bit, you know, like shy, a little bit thingy. Look, they're not from the generation that we're talking about, but I've watched them grow into and mature into performers. And if not necessarily in the cage, that's not the type of performer I'm talking about. I'm talking about the starting to take accountability for their own results, the starting to take accountability for their own behavior, their approach, their attitude. Because again, it comes down to the inte integrity and it comes down to the truth. In order for you to earn that, earn some kind of competence, like real competence, it requires you to suffer a little bit. It requires you to be uncomfortable. It requires you to keep turning up despite despite that um, and to figure out a problem. Um, and if you can't do that, it's not that all you always have to suffer, but if you can't sit with a problem long enough, you'll never be, you'll never be good at solving anything. 100%. And you talked about earlier about how it builds self-esteem and confidence in you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? A thought experiment, yeah? Yeah. Let's say your MMA training has gone out the window. Mm -hmm. Physical training out the window. You've got no MMA training. Yeah. You walk into a room now yeah. full of people. Yeah. How do you feel psychologically? I, I would be absolutely delusional to have some form of physical confidence. Exactly. Into a room. Exactly. Insecure. Insecure. I would 100%. Insecure. I, I, be, and, you know, like I said, lack of confidence. That's how most people are walking around, you know? Yeah, yeah. Imagine being stripped of your skills, your MMA skills, your confidence that it gives you. Yeah. I'm not talking about MMA and just competing in the ring. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about you can go to the gym, even yeah, going yeah. to the gym, doing a bit of strength training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is priceless, man. Yeah, so yeah. that's why I would encourage everybody yeah. to get in some form of like combat sports. Yeah. Because we live in an age of convenience. Yeah. People yeah. are making manufacturing discomfort. So for example, ice baths in the morning, just yeah, to put yeah, themselves yeah, in yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. situation. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's mad, it's crazy. I, I have a joke about that. Um, is someone, I can't remember it yesterday, but someone's like, like oh, are you going, would you go camping or uh, would you, would you would you have an ice bath or do you do ice bath? And it's like, man, my granddad would be absolutely fuming if he came to this country and I'm out here camping. Like, we, we why did we escape the village <laughs> for me to go camp and make it up? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think people manufacture discomfort because they haven't had any. And I, do you know what? I think if you haven't had any, that's okay, man. Man, manufacture yeah. some discomfort. That's, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, man, that's all good, man. Yeah. Get some ice bath down you. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I, I like what Carl said, though, because a lot of people have a misconception about MMA, that yeah. it's all about thugs going in there, yeah. training, hooligans, and getting yeah. into football fights. But yeah. actually, a lot of them are good citizens, good morality, with good integrity, integral value should I say yeah um so for example Carl said I was looking at the, at the website right and he's like um, it's not about beating up six guys it's actually about avoidance distance management um being aware of your surrounding don't be at the wrong place at the wrong time yeah the last thing you want to do is engage in one-on-one -on -one combat is yeah. that what you teach it to your students as well yeah I mean I I don't say that stuff in classes um, yeah. and neither did Carl to be fair but it is so and this comes down to jujitsu. We, 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 we ingrain this in our students as well. Um, when they come in, do jujitsu, most places do Brazilian jujitsu. And if you're not, if you're, un, if you're unfamiliar with Brazilian jujitsu, it's, it's basically everything that happens once you hit the ground. So a lot of it, the submission grappling side of things, once you hit the ground. Now, jujitsu as a sport takes place also in that same, in that same thing. And kind of rightfully so. Right, um, it's people like, oh, well, why are they rolling around if it's for self-defense? Like, why are they on the ground? And I am 100% confident that if I fought an untrained guy, I can start off with my back lying down on the front, on the floor, right? Because my jiu-jitsu, I feel like, is good enough to do that, right? Um, I'll be able to sweep him, I'll be able to get on top, and, and all that stuff's come from just being coached well. Um, and But the sport of jiu-jitsu doesn't give you any points for standing up to your feet. It doesn't give you any, it doesn't, and once you take that away, the incentive to actually have the capacity to hold somebody down is gone. Um, and so we start 
we start optimizing for a sport that no longer serves the that that can no longer serve the purpose of why the martial arts there in the first place. And Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was is there as a martial art one, so you can learn how to fight and you can learn to strangle people, you can learn to snap some arms and shoulders and all that stuff. That's great. But if you can't get back to your feet, and if you if the number one thing, the number one thing I I get the most proud of from what, when you guys start rolling is how good are they at getting back to their feet? How good are they at surviving? And those are the things I value more than like, oh, who's getting the next submission? And that's because, and we repeat this in sessions, right? You have to, it's a prerequisite. If you can't get, you have to be able to get back to your feet. It will score you zero points in a jiu-jitsu tournament, right? right? You'll get scored zero points. You might get taken down up and again, and it might score you negative points. I don't give a fuck. You have to be able to get back to your feet. Um, because if you can't get back to your feet, why are you training? Like, what are you doing this for? So then you can go to a sports hall, pay 50 quid, win a win a gold medal that's worth about a pound um, with some other guys rolling around the floor. Not None of you motherfuckers can get back to your feet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, that's not always the case. Um, I think there's a lot of value in competition and, and all that stuff. But I think we if we if we forget if we forget about instilling that in in students, where else are they supposed to learn it from? Um, where else are they supposed to learn to get back to their This feet? reminds me of the the conversation um, that we had a bit earlier in the yeah. beginning, which is uh, boxing versus wrestling. Yeah. You, you said uh, wrestling wings nine times out of 10 in, yes. a, in a street fight. Yeah, absolutely. I, in fact, I wouldn't even go nine times out of 10. I'd go 10 times out of 10. So I disagree. And I'm not an MMA coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason why I disagree is because of uh, the scenario I posted before where novice... Jake Paul, yeah. who just started boxing three yeah. years into it, beats a seasoned fighter. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's a it's a you know yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a boxing, boxing match. match. Yeah, yeah. But what was so su surprising to me is because MMA utilize striking in their yeah. structure, right? Training yeah. program. So let me ask you this straight up, bro. Cool. Why do MMA fighters suck at boxing? Because their boxing is unrefined. That's why. I think partially because most MMA guys, naturally, when they walk into a gym, world, they're like, well, there's Thai boxing and there's boxing and Thai boxing has, unless you use kicks and elbows and knees, so that's the way to go instead of boxing. Whereas boxing, you don't have a choice but to use your hands. And I love boxing for that reason because, they're, because they only have a couple of weapons, everything else becomes refined. The footwork becomes refined. Distance management com becomes better. Um, the tactical side of boxing becomes better. Um, reading patterns becomes better. Exploiting patterns becomes better. The nature of having a 14 round fight and being able to game plan across the way, using the first three, four, five rounds to observe, using the next couple of rounds to make any small adjustments. All that stuff gets thrown out of the window um, a lot and it gets dismissed because people are like, well, Thai boxing or kickboxing has kicks and knees and elbows, so we should do that instead. Um, and in fact, with my guys, especially as a base that I haven't trained before, they always have a boxing base. And now I said that thing about wrestlers versus boxers. Yeah. Uh, not because I don't rate boxing. I absolutely rate boxing. I love boxing. I watch boxing like nonstop. When I you watch a street fight, nine times out of 10, like on a YouTube video, yeah. yeah. It's just unfair, in my opinion, because a boxer has an advantage. So I'm actually quite surprised you choose a wrestler. It's very rare you're going to get on the ground unless you're getting jumped. No. Do you reckon? Well, what are you talking about? D double takedowns, that kind of thing? Here's or? the thing, right? UFC 1 has run this experiment already hmm. where they just invited all fighters from everywhere. Um, and Jiu-Jitsu won that one because nobody understood what Jiu-Jitsu is. And to be fair, I, th I still think, uh, I think any form of grappler um, would do better in a fight than any, any form of striker, um, whether that's boxing, tie boxing, kickboxing, whatever. And this is the reason why is if they're, if they're both trained, the odds of you, you will have to knock that person out with the first shot you throw, right? And if you don't, you are getting taken for a ride. And I've seen this on the times, over time on the doors. Um, I've worked with guys that also wrestled and and did um, done MMA, and it's all the same thing. None of us will ever hit anyone that's untrained, if because it's just there's too much of a 50 50 chance there um, of the other person hurting you as well. Now that said, if a boxer lands immediately, like yeah, okay, unless the guy's out cold, and you're sp you're speaking of a wrestler here who's are well known, are like well known for their grit, well known for like being tough. 
the person just being stood upright yeah. is a massive gift to them. Do you know what I mean? There's a reason wrestlers wrestle like super low because they they have their own version of fainting and like all that stuff. Someone that's stood up for a wrestler is like someone standing like this for a boxer. Really? Yeah. Um, the, it's, it's much easier to wrestle someone stood up. And if you don't hit the knock them out with your first shot, I promise you, if you haven't trained wrestling before and someone's wrestled, if they get a hold of you, you are getting, you're not only getting, to, you're not getting taken down, you're getting dumped. Do you think it's better to be well-rounded and train in multiple disciplines or get really, really good at one, like Habib at wrestling? I think it depends person to person. I do think you need to be well-rounded, but I think it's okay to have a, a clear strength. Um, what it would depend on there is if you are going to get clearly good on one thing, you need to have, you need to be able to funnel people into that game. So that's what Khabib's really good at. It's not just that his wrestling's good; it just he manages to turn every fight into a wrestling, into a wrestling battle. Um, and getting good at doing that is more important, is just as important as the wrestling itself. So if I, like, Izzy does this really well, right? Izzy Adesanya. Adesanya. Yeah. Where he manages to turn every fight into a, a striking bout. Do you know what I mean? And when he didn't with Jan, he had, he had trouble and he lost that fight. Why do you think people struggle with the Dagestani style, man? Like no efficiency. one has an answer for it, right? The Dagestani style of wrestling that we see um, is extremely efficient. There's no, the, uh, it looks like there's a lot of big explosions which there are a few and they can afford it because the rest of the time they're extremely efficient. Um, I think any, I think if you look at the mastery of any kind of mechanical skill, it's the, all the people at that stage are efficient. If you look at great boxes. When you say efficient, are you talking about the preservation of energy? Yeah, I'm talking about efficient preservation of energy in a long way, like macro, um, and also efficient mechanics. So, they get the most output out of, boom, like Floyd Mayweather, efficient. Do you know, he doesn't look like he's, he, he's, he's not blowing out his ass, do you know what I mean, when he's fighting, he's, he's efficient. Um, Andre Ward, efficient, do you know what I mean? Like mm. all these guys are efficient and all, to be fair, all, this is what I love about boxers as well, is all good boxers and there's a lot of them are all efficient. Um, and I think in MMA, because there's so much to learn, we try and fill those holes in skill with athleticism. Um, and by its nature, the more athletic we are, the less we have to rely on efficiency. And so in the long run, it becomes a detriment. Um, not that people shouldn't be athletic, that's not what I'm saying. It's just <laughs> um, when we rely on it too heavily, um, we become, we give up there's no incentive to build a skill until we need it and then it's too late we talked about briefly about you know fighters pay mm -hmm. uh, in boxing it's all about ticket sales yeah right you can be a talented fighter in the world but if you ain't got a big social media following you ain't making a name for yourself you, you know no one's gonna promote you stuff like that no one's gonna take you on board because it comes down to the benjamins you know yeah. it's a business at the end of the day yeah. i was just curious bro is it the same uh when it comes to the ufc the people that are trying to make a name for themselves you got some guy called jack you mentioned that's going to be up and coming yeah what does yeah. it look like in terms of monetary gain is it the same you're making pretty much zero money up until you get recognized by the no, ufc for example I, I think i think you can make some money yeah. uh, before the ufc um but it's not enough. It's it's a scoffable amount for for being an, for being a professional athlete. Um, I think it still comes down it still comes down to ticket sales. Um, I think in the UFC, ticket sales actually matter less. On the way to the UFC, you're gonna have to build a name to get to the right promotions. You're gonna have, that are also gonna boost your boost your branding. Before that, pre UFC it is all is building your personal brand. But while you're doing that, you have to make direct sales, right? So you have to be able to sell tickets in order to have the promoter want you on. Um, if you're not, if you don't sell a lot of tickets, be prepared to fight someone that does and the promoter have a vested interest in you losing that fight. Um, and even if they even if they can't do anything necessarily about it, they do have a vested interest in you losing if unless you're unless you can sell tickets. 
Um, so there is an element of business involved, even at the smaller levels. Absolutely. Yeah. And in some way, it's unavoidable. Um, because, you know, why would a promoter go through the headache of putting on a card, finding a venue, flight day pullouts, making sure everyone's on weight, like all these things for them to not make money. Um, and even if they don't, even if they're doing it for the love of the sport, like we we get incentivized to take care of the things that take care of us. So you makes know, sense, brother. Yeah. Makes sense. Dana White is getting a lot of st- stick for not paying his fighters apparently. You know what they're worth. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you got the likes of Francis Ngannou now fighting Tyson Fury. Yeah. Right. He went. I think his last fight he made five hundred k. Yeah. In the, in USC. the USC. Yeah, yeah. Now he's set to make eight figures. Yeah. Fighting yeah. Tyson Fury. Yeah, yeah. Ten million plus here. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. mad. The thing is with UFC is they're a market leader. Um, and in, in boxing, there isn't one. There isn't one like this. There's WBO and like whatever, but like there's not, yeah, there's not one market leader. So as long as someone pumps enough money behind a promotion, people tune in, people tune in for the fight rather than the yeah. promotion. Whereas with the MMA, they put, they tune in for the promotion first rather than the fight. No one knows who you are until you get to the UFC. 100% brother. Other than your friends. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Just to conclude the podcast, let's talk about the Wayfair Academy, okay. right? Just give us a brief overview of how it sort of formed and who you partnered up with to make it happen yeah. sort of thing. So the Wayfair formed um, because I I thought as an industry, we could, we could probably do better. Um, nothing wrong with the way things are done before then. Um, I just think as times move on, we need to, we need to keep pushing the envelope. Um, that was something Carl was great at. So, you know, I wanted to push the envelope. So we we opened up Wayfarer. We, we decided to focus on the main reason for Wayfarer opening up is because we want to make sure we build skill and we have skill at the forefront. Now, everyone has different goals in terms of someone wants to win a world title. The 45 year old dad of two kids wants to come in and do two, three sessions a week. And that's fine. But they all have the same, they all have the underlying, uh, a desire to get better and more skilled. And so if we optimize for that, we can serve everyone in the community and not have it exclusive to athletes or exclusive to like, uh, have it as a McDojo where it's like, come in, come in 45 year olds, dad, we'll, we'll teach you MMA, you know, like it keeps it real, keeps it honest. Uh, so, so you aimed at educating men, women, and children, the sweet signs of MMA at all levels. At all levels. And yeah. I think that's something we do the best. Um, or that's something we do, we we absolutely optimize for, is we have our classes, we have we have them structured as one-on-ones, two-on-ones, three-on-ones, and it's not basic beginner advance, it's like we have clear objectives to the session. So one-on-one's purely mechanical, two-on-one is like decision-making, inspiring, and, and getting comfortable actually using the skills. Three-on-one is, is finding the, meld, the, the melting bits between disciplines, so shoot boxing, wall wrestling, MMA sparring. Um, so we have, we have, clear objectives to the sessions. The coaches have clear objectives to the sessions. Um, no one is wasting your time. No one is wasting their own time. So members can come in and if it's a busy dad, he can do a 45 minute session, get what he came for, go home, right? However, if you're a keen athlete, you can spend all day there, right? And that's what we want. So we, we, wanted, we wanted everyone to be able to come into the gym. We wanted any problems surrounding training as easy as possible. So you don't turn up to the gym, you finish work two hours early, and but it's too early to go to the gym, but too late to go home and come back. So yeah. you can actually come to the gym, the gym stays Interesting. Open. So we wanted to make the lifestyle of training as easy as possible, right? So we've got a Wi-Fi cafe area so people can work from home and they do, they work from home in the gym, right? Um, we have a Wi-Fi cafe area where students come in and they, they just plug away on their assignments, time for sessions, they close the laps up, they go upstairs and we love that, right? We want it to be a place where you can come in and you want to be there. Um, and if we can do that, then the results will take care of themselves and let us handle the coaching. We have strength and conditioning areas, um, which other gyms do have, but we keep our, the differences is our gym is actually open. So we have two strength and conditioning areas, so you don't have to get another gym membership somewhere else. You can just lift all in house. We have changing rooms, we have showers, we have an infrared sauna for women. We have an infrared sauna for men just to push that recovery because everything we want people to have the lifestyle of training regardless of who they are, what their goals are, as long as they come in to learn how to get better at martial arts. That's it. 
Amazing, bro. Well said. That was beautiful. That, that's, that's an ad, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But yeah, I got it down to the T. Um, where can people reach out if they want to be coached by yourself or the Wayfair Academy? Um, Best place to reach out is it Instagram, for example. You or? can DM us on Instagram um, or you can just book in for uh, trials directly on our website. It's, it takes three clicks. Awesome, brother. Coach Abdul Chowdhury, thanks for coming on the podcast, yeah, bro. no problem. It's been amazing having you on the podcast, man. Yeah, yeah, likewise. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to leave a comment, like, and subscribe. It helps the channel more than you know. With that being said, we'll see you in the next one. Peace.